How, how do you put this behind you and move forward? That's something I, I ask each missing person family because I don't understand how you can do that. I can't. Yeah. I mean, you know, I want some type of closure. I want him to be found. One of the most confusing and frustrating investigations by law enforcement is related to people who disappear in highly rural locations, forests, plains, deserts, and regions with few residences. These cases offer no witnesses, few clues, and a strange lack of evidence. Where are these people? How did they disappear without leaving a scent trail, no tracks, and a distinct lack of physical evidence? The investigator is left with a distraught family grieving about a missing loved one, wanting them found, where many times the search area is the size of a national forest. My name is David Politis. I'm a former San Jose police officer who has worked complex and long-term investigations while being assigned to vice intelligence, street crimes, SWAT, and various detective roles. I'm a best-selling author, investigating missing people in national parks, forests, and rural locations for over 20 years. The investigative process has led me to interview incredible witnesses that tell a fantastic story that challenges the investigative protocols every detective follows. We are staring at unconventional possibilities supported by witnesses, video, and most recently, our own government. The human species has been walking the earth for thousands of years, hunting, gathering, and observing. From the moment we left our cave, we have looked to the skies in amazement and wonder about unidentified objects. In just the last 100 plus years, we have left the ground and flown into the clouds with a different perspective about our life in this world. We've continued to be amazed and perplexed by flying objects that have capabilities far beyond what our government says is ours. Are these craft piloted by entities that have our best interests? Is our planet merely the ant farm for complex societies light years from Earth? Could it be we offer other worlds new DNA that's needed to refurbish their existence? Or are they driven by a plan that is so far beyond our capability to comprehend that the human mind isn't programmed to accept and live with the consequences? Join me on a fact-finding journey that has never been disclosed. Keep an open mind on the possibilities and a warm and compassionate heart for the missing. In multiple missing 411 books, it looks like people are snatched out of the, off the ground, and then some of them are dropped back into these uh, locations, the little kids that are suddenly miles and miles away. It, it seems like, I know you don't want to commit to uh, any particular explanation because you don't have enough evidence to, to point to one in particular, but some of the stuff certainly ventures into the area of the paranormal, and... Uh, and one of the stories that I was able to break earlier this year was about Skinwalker Ranch, that uh, a program that had been created by the Pentagon uh, to look at UFOs also went much further than it, it studied what we would call paranormal events, unexplained mysteries at places like Skinwalker Ranch and elsewhere. And earlier this year, I was invited to go back by Senator Harry Reid to meet with some people whose names I cannot, uh, cannot make public. One of these guys pulls me aside, and then he said, you know, we think that that guy, Dave Politis, that uh, that his mystery with these missing people might be related to the phenomena at the ranch. But the idea that the phenomena that's been seen there, which is sometimes playful and sometimes dangerous, might be related to yours, startled me. And I don't know how you react to that, but uh, maybe it makes you uncomfortable uh, being associated with anything as weird as that, but your stuff's pretty weird too. So after reviewing several thousand missing person cases, several distinct facts started to come up. And I started to put piles of these reports in different areas of my room that indicated certain points of importance. And after a while, I started to call these profile points. As an example, in 97% of the cases that I research, uh, one of the profile points is that canines brought to the scene can't pick up a scent trail. 
they bring trackers to the scene and they can't find tracks leaving the location that the person was last seen at. So the number one profile point in our work is lack of scent trail. Some of the most common profile points would be weather-related issues, either just as the person disappears or just after they're, they're missing or when the search starts, there's a weather incident that inhibits the searcher's ability to find the individual. Another one is the victim found in an area that was previously searched. Oftentimes, an area will be searched five, six, seven times. And then all of a sudden, when they're getting ready to pull out, the search and rescue says, we give up. They find the person in the middle of the area that had been searched many, many times. Oftentimes, when somebody goes missing, they go missing in an area near water or boulders or swamps and bogs. And once these profile points were established, and this is after reading thousands of reports, I started to document them and say, okay, if these are gonna be the profile points that we use moving forward, then these will be the ones that we have to look for in the reports as they come in. This has become the overshadowing criteria for a missing 411 case. And in this instance, we're in Vancouver, British Columbia, and we're researching a case of a missing hunter, someone who had visited the same location 20 times in 20 years. It's a location that he and his wife have come to many times. In this instance, he came out alone. He brought his dogs, his camper, and his raft, do a little fishing, sightseeing, and just relaxing in nature. And then he disappeared on the shores of Harrison Lake. And we still don't know what really happened to Ray Salmon. Ray was an outdoor camper, hunter, fisherman. Grew up in the woods, Northern Ontario. Uh, very experienced and uh, safe uh, outdoorsman. 32 years, we were married together for about a year and a half before that. He would have rather gone hunting, camping with me than with anyone else. He was always telling me that, but I'm a fair weather camper. I would not have been out in the bush if it wasn't for Ray. Ray made it wonderful. At the time I met him, he was about 65, just recently retired. He worked for Rogers Sugar in Vancouver as chief maintenance man. He was empathetic. He was concerned about what you felt about something, which is rare today. And uh, I, I liked that. I enjoyed his company. He's the type of guy who's from the old school. He had this adventurous spirit. He had a map of British Columbia in a booklet form. Very seldom would I find a blank page part of this province that Ray hadn't visited. So he drove up to Harrison Lake from your home here. Right. In a truck with a camper. Right. And what else did he have with him? A fridge, a furnace, uh, air conditioner, a few rifles, and maybe a couple pistols with him. And he took his Zodiac with him and had a motor on the Zodiac. He had a complete life jacket, good flotation device. So fully equipped, he had uh, the two dogs, and if anything comes around, they would bark. He'd been to this spot many times before. Many times, because you can get there when he was still working. He could go Friday after work and get there and, and uh, set up camp and been with him a couple of times. We've gone for a week at a time. And again, for clarity, he doesn't go and just sit at his camper all day. No. He's out going over the hillsides, walking around. So he's been all through the mountainsides in this area many times in the past. Correct. He says, oh yeah, I'm gonna camp down by the lake in this certain spot. So he says, I gotta get going now because I gotta set up camp before dark. That's the last time I've seen him. We were planning to go out up the lake and look for old gold mines. He says, I'll come down in the Zodiac and pick you up on Monday morning. On Sunday afternoon, I was uh, doing some repair work on a trailer up here, and we heard three gunshots. Home alone, downstairs watching TV, and the doorbell rings, and it was a Vancouver City police officer, and she was asking if Ray Salmon is home. I said, well, what is it? What's wrong? Why are you asking me this? And she said she didn't have um, 
any information, and, and I couldn't contact Ray, even though he had a cell phone, there isn't any uh, um, cell phone coverage at Harrison Lake. I think I phoned the RCP at about five in the morning, and they were very brief. They never gave me any details at the time. They just said, uh, he's missing. So I didn't know if he was walking with a dog somewhere and didn't make it back. And as he said to me, if you're injured, if you're in the woods and you're injured, you wait for them to come to you. Don't start trying to crawl around, wasting energy if you can't. Uh, they will come and they will look for you. And I thought, okay, I know what's happened now. A call came in about going out to search for a possible missing person at this spot. The team knew I was actually, I had a lot of experience in this area. So I was one of the first team members to arrive at that scene that day. When we showed up, his truck and camper were right at this very spot. All his belongings were kind of laid out under the tarp. His truck and camper looked in great shape. The RCMP goes up, they find the truck and the camper locked. Dogs inside, two dogs, and nobody's around. If Ray went out for a hike, would he take the dogs? Definitely. So he wouldn't leave them in there. Never leave the dogs. He thought, this is, this is what he's got the dogs for. So in your mind, why would he lock the camper door? Unless there was a danger to the dogs, but what kind of danger would be there to the dogs? It was the strangest thing. I've never showed up to a search where we had full ERT members, and there was guys with fully automatic weapons, and I remember it very specifically because I've never showed up to a search where we're searching alongside emergency response team members. I was with the RCMP for 31 years, and back here, where I'm from, in the Fraser Valley, I was here for 22 years. Are you familiar with the Ray Salmon disappearance on Harrison Lake? Yes. So, on a disappearance of a, a missing person case, can you fathom in your own mind why they would send out an RCMP SWAT team? For the unanswered questions, are we looking at someone who got murdered? Are we looking at somebody who got kidnapped? Or they may have a tip that nobody knows about, I don't know about, top secret kind of stuff. I remember an officer telling me, kids showed up at the Agassiz RCMP detachment saying that their vehicle was shot at. And I remember later talking to the RCMP officer saying that kids reported their headlights being shot out. If he shot out somebody's headlights, and he was that good of a shot to shoot out the headlights, then he was probably trying to get attention to where he was. I don't know if I would shoot at someone's car to get attention because what's going in my mind is, oh my God, what if I accidentally hit someone? Now, we know Ray was a responsible hunter, had a license to have his guns, had hunted for decades. So yeah, I, I'm with you. I believe that that is very strange behavior. I remember thinking, well, that, that wouldn't have been Ray. Ray wouldn't be shooting. If he did anything, uh, as he told me, you shoot three times in the air for SOS. Now there's more to the story than just Ray missing, but not knowing what. Right directly behind him was the grad party. So the party was happening up over here. There was estimated to be about 50, 50 people at that party, and there was a, a massive amount of garbage we cleaned up when we got here. And they, they didn't consider that possible evidence as well? Something seemed wrong um, at that point. When you hear the search and rescue person's rendition of what just happened, I don't think in 7,000 cases that I've ever heard anything so strange as telling a search and rescue group to go pick up a grad party's remains of what they left, and then coupled with the fact that there were shots fired at the scene, and they bring in a special weapons team to the area. But that wasn't it. The more you hear, the stranger the story gets. We would hike for a couple hours in here and start grid searching, and we would just basically come back to this point and then go again. Then we also got on ATVs, and so we had boats. We had uh, two watercraft in the lake at that time searching the shoreline air support as well. And I remember when I first talked to you, you said you were told not to go into the bush. On the second day, his belongings were found by air. They spotted his clothes. Now this is a day, if not two days after the initial search. It wasn't even probably an hour or two after that. I remember the corporal, the RCMP members, still in uniform, coming out of the bush saying, it's unsearchable, we found his, his, his clothes. 
um, it's not worth it to go in there. It's so clear because I was like, nothing is unsearchable. Why would they all of a sudden just call it that quickly? I asked Adam to show me the location where Ray's clothes were found. Strangely, there was even a worn out search and rescue tag on a tree. This is where his clothes were probably most likely found. It's very old. It's, yeah, it would be from that time period. The search uncovered via helicopter some folded items under a log in his rifle 400 yards north of his truck, right on the beach. And then over a small hill, quite a distance away, they found his pistol laying in a meadow. They would, they would give me bits and pieces. They would call and they would say, oh, we found Ray's backpack under a tree. And then later on, they told me somewhere in a field they found his nine millimeter. And I thought, Ray would never leave a pistol anywhere. So you're into it a few days. They found these items. Uh, I read that it was the feeling of the RCMP that he must be in the water. Is that true? As they were saying, oh, we think he, he must have, have drowned. And I thought, well, that doesn't make any sense. His boat is at the campsite. So he wouldn't have fallen off the boat. And if he was on the boat, he would have had his life jacket on. The official report says he was injured and got into the water and was trying to swim back, and that's how he drowned. But it was hard to believe. If anybody said, well, he was stripping his clothes because he had hypothermia. It wasn't raining, and it was June. It was, it was warm, and I was even up at 6,000 feet elevation, and I was in a t-shirt sweating. They never found any traces of any blood, animal or human. They even said it was unusual that they had that many tracking dogs. I never found a track. Or a scent. Or a scent. That's an important point. When you go from the point of the pistol, from the camper, to the beach, there, you have an established area to start from, to go to. It's not like you're going blindly at this point. So the dogs should have been able to track Ray point to point to point pretty easily. And they didn't. The RCMP had a search boat combing the shoreline. Ray's wife also hired a private response team to come in and also search the area. No body was ever recovered. So Daniela went out with the search boat and actually spent hours on scene looking for her husband. I had arranged with the Ralstons to come down and uh, search for Ray. Daniela told us from the beginning that she thought that the RCMP was pushing this probability that Ray was in the water. And in talking to search and rescue people, they didn't necessarily believe Ray was in the water. And I'm not sure if you guys were aware, but they found his pistol on top of a mountain, not even anywhere near the water. And Daniela said, there's no way Ray yeah. would lose his pistol. Yeah. Had yeah, you we, heard that? We hadn't heard that, no. So it was interesting. Initially, I don't think they wanted to give me back his um, guns and rifles. How about the backpack? No, I didn't get that back. Don't you think that's odd? They weren't there to explain themselves to me. Ever be a reason to lie to the victim family? No. Not, not for, from police, no. Ever? No, never. It became blatantly obvious that the RCMP was withholding information from Daniela. Files obtained through the Freedom of Information Act turned up blacked out paragraphs. I've encountered similar issues through the Freedom of Information Act and the release of details. Some of the off-the-record interviews that we were doing alluded to a connection to some of the local legends and bizarre sightings within this area. People that go missing or these things that happen that don't quite make sense, it happens in an area where a lot of time there's gold or there's a history, there's a legacy, there's legends, there's stories of, of past occurrences. There's a reason why they're called Sky Ancestors. We heard that the RCMP has a policy about UFOs. Yes. Tell us about that. If you get involved with a UFO investigation, it is you hand that information over. I don't know where it goes. So somebody somewhere yeah. is collecting and tracking this information. I would say so, yes. You have to. You cannot let that stuff go. And they take it seriously. Yep. Yeah. Yep, that information is collected and not wherever it goes into some secret something. So during the interview with the RCMP officer that was retired, 
uh, it reminded me of a document that I saw several years ago. In March of 1960, the RCMP had a document that would have been classified as restricted that had to do with the Athabascan Indians seeing a UFO in the general area of where Ray Salmon disappeared. And that document, in essence, says that they saw something that we would consider today to be your standard cylindrical UFO. We were camping once at a place called Fire Lake. And we were just sitting around the campfire in the evening and, and there's a, a large lake and on the other side there's a mountain. And there wasn't any logging going on at that mountain. And we're sitting there and we could see a light across the lake. I was saying, oh, there, there must be logging going on there. It looks like there's a car. And Ray said, that's not a car. And he goes, I know for a fact he, there isn't any logging going on there. He knows all the roads, all the back hills. He's hiked everywhere. But as we're looking at this light, it's traveling very quickly and doing 90 degree turns, very unusual. So a car in the mountains wouldn't have been traveling that way. And it wasn't just a flash. We were sitting there watching this. And I, I remember sitting there for a good 10 minutes watching this and almost enjoying this. I thought this is fascinating. You ever seen anything strange in the skies out here? Well, I've been here a long time. When I had the cottage over there, I had some friends and he came up with his girlfriend and they camped on the beach. I guess it was about 2.30 in the morning. They were in the tent on the beach in the middle of the night, asleep. My friend said, I was sleeping like that and all of a sudden I knew there was a light. It woke me up. And the inside of the tent was like daylight. He, un he unzipped the door and looks outside. And it was like the 12 o'clock high noon on the clearest day of the year. And he can see the, the beach and the water and all that for, but he couldn't see past a certain area, so it was lit up. And that clicked, hey, that, I never, I, you know, hey, I believe in what they told me because somebody else told me the same thing. As an investigator who has a very open mind and absorbs all the details, no matter how outlandish and strange, I really have to put some parameters up sometimes about how far down the rabbit hole I'll go. Considering this, I had a good friend in the state of Washington that is really a UFO expert, and I want to take it to him. My name is Peter Davenport. I'm, for the last 26 years, I've been the director of the National UFO Reporting Center, and that's what I do. I'm a UFO investigator. What is the difference between MUFON and what you do in your organization? Well, they're two separate organizations. MUFON is an older organization, and MUFON is more of an investigative body. It's a membership organization. The National UFO Reporting Center has one member, and that is I. Do you ever investigate any of the reports you get? Yeah, once in a while. I've investigated an elk abduction, and I've investigated crop formations. It takes a lot of, lot of resource to investigate a case. You brought up the elk case that you investigated in Washington. I was actually at a conference when the call came in. He told a story about uh, 14 or 15 people, I think it was, who were out planting trees on a hillside on a big piece of property owned by a commercial logging company. They had seen an object approach from the east and they stood there and watched it for a few seconds. He called the, the object to the attention of the workers and they all looked up and saw it as well. And it flew towards a herd of elk that these guys had been watching all morning long as they worked on a hillside. All the elk bolted to the northeast to heavy cover, except for one hapless elk. And the object lifted the elk off the ground, and it started moving slowly in the direction in which that herd of elk had gone. And it came to a large tree, an evergreen tree, and bumped into it, interestingly, and backed away from the tree, and then suddenly shot to the north and went over the uh, nearest ridge to the north. I called the individual back who had made the call to the hotline and who had left a message and arranged to travel to the site. Was the company that the property was on 
assisting in this research? They directed question to Peter Davenport. Let's put it that way. So were they interested? Definitely. Was there one general nationality of the workers? Hispanic. Or would they speak English? No. Nobody really knew exactly what went on until we got some good translation. That's when I decided we needed to get somebody that was one in the UFO community and two could translate well. And that's when we, when I contacted Ruben down in California. I had contacted uh, some of the workers and to arrange for us to meet. And you gained their trust too, because these, these gentlemen were pretty shook up. I would say they were in their uh, late 20s, early 30s. They were married, have families, yeah. Yeah, very res very responsible folks. The three witnesses saw this object slowly uh, descending and then went toward the elk herd, which caused the elk to run. But he was able to see the object picking up the elk. It was not a big object at all. The, the witnesses emphasized how surprised they were at how small it was and still be able to lift an elk out of the forest. What they, what they did was they looked at the elk, they looked at the craft, and they said, well, okay, if the elk is this big, the craft's got to be somewhere between mm, six and eight feet long, about five feet wide, with a little indentation in the back, about 18 inches thick. It had a red and a white stripe that weren't lights, but the white stripe was like a bright enamel paint. The red stripe was a duller color. So when the men in the group saw this craft take the elk out of sight, yeah, what was the distance from where they were to the where they finally saw it? The, I would say the trees where it ran into was a quarter mile. But basically, I think it became a small dot before it disappeared into the, into the cloud cover. The object was silent. And as soon as it got over the elk, the elk was basically paralyzed. It looked like it was a statue. It was just stiff. The distance of the elk from the craft always stayed consistent? Yes. How thick was the cable between the craft and the elk? There was no cable. There was nothing discernible that was holding the elk to the craft. The, the movement was like, like a coin. Uh, it was a slow oscillation. It took about two and a half seconds for it to complete a cycle. And it's as if, if you've ever spun a coin, and when that coin is getting lower and lower, so it's almost flat, and it goes around on its rim, that's the type of oscillation. What are the chances, Peter, that that could have been some kind of test vehicle that our military has and they were just trying out their technology? About as close to zero as you can get. Could the craft have been a helicopter? No. In your research as an investigator, is that common? Yes, uh, many times. So in reports that we get um, from witnesses, they'll say that they, were, they heard no, no noise at all. Did you ever go out and try to find the elk? We did. We found what we think may have been the elk. Uh, it was a dead creature by the time we got to it, but we did a cursory examination, could find no bullet holes, no arrows sticking in it, no wounds, it had good teeth, it was well fed. We think it was a female, a pregnant female elk. Describe the setting that you saw the elk in. It was beside a road and it was in the valley to the north of the valley where these men were planting trees. It leads me to suspect, but have no evidence, that the craft flew over the ridge to the north of where these men were working and may have dropped the elk or left it off. So how many days was it from the time that they saw the elk get pulled up by the craft until someone found that elk on the road? The elk was found before seven days had transpired. Does that case rank up there with you as far as strangeness and credibility? Yeah, it's a pretty strange case. Uh, it's not every day that witnesses see a UFO, what we presume was a UFO, an alien spacecraft, lift an animal off the ground and fly off with it. 
that's pretty unusual by any measure. Were any of them concerned that, hey, maybe one of these things should come over and take me? Yeah. Did they voice that concern? Yes, they did. They, uh, some weren't quite sure if they wanted to go back to the woods and work again. Listening to his voice, and I could really see the actual event that's happening to him as he's describing it. And he was shook up about it. Is he emotional? From what I recall, uh, he had a hard time sleeping for, for several days after he saw that. His words were whether he thought whether it was something prehistoric or it was something extraterrestrial. So when you heard that this elk was taken and you, and you heard the witnesses, at the end of the investigation, what was your belief? Credible? Incredible? Borderline? It, it was credible. Everyone was credible. No one appeared to be wanting to hmm, foist a, a story on, uh, about anything. They, it was just the opposite. They were reluctant, really upset them. They really didn't even want to think about it. Did they give you any indication at all that this was fabrication? No, dude. But I, I would stake my reputation. Uh, no, they're, they were telling the truth. After the interview, I received a call from Robert Fairfax regarding the dead elk. Hey, Robert. Hi, Dave. Yes, I'm calling back because uh, when I did the interview, there's a couple things I, I forgot, Dan, but I did meet with a representative of the company when Peter and I initially went down to find out they had a chronic wasting disease, which is a prion disease that attacks the brain and they had been finding quite a few elk, dead elk, in the area. So in the 1980s in the UK, there was something called mad cow disease. It's a prion disease and it infected cows. In the UK, they initially said that these animals couldn't transmit the disease to people. And they said not to worry. Well, it ended up transferring people, and it killed hundreds. And the UK ended up slaughtering over four million cattle because of this prion disease that we know as mad cow. Well, in the US, there's something that's come about where chronic wasting disease is now infecting deer, moose, elk, cervids, and this disease is spread across the US, and it's centered on Colorado and Wyoming. This disease is fatal 100% of the time to all cervids. The state governments of each of the 50 states have told hunters to get their animals tested and not to eat the meat of an infected animal. And they've never stated yet that this can transfer to human, but it's consistent in that it says, don't eat the animal. Chronic wasting disease seems to be something that is out of control. State and federal governments don't have an answer on how to control it. And right now, it seems as though there's some type of monitoring going on across the U.S. of these infected animals. In Washington, Peter Davenport identified one case and attributed it to CWD. Now, he identified a case in the state of Idaho involving hunters that is equally as unusual. Hi, I'm Chris Bales, and I have a little incident that uh, I ran into on September 27th, the year 2000. Um, something that uh, most people would never, ever see or believe. We were in the middle of Idaho, out in a pretty remote area. Who were you with? Um, I was with my brother Mark and a friend of ours uh, through construction, Rob, and then his dad um, was with us. Describe the spot where you were camping. Hard to get down in, and then when you get down in there, it was pretty tight. Um, steep canyon and, and tall timber. And it was kind of a dark, dark hole down in there. And had you been to this spot before? We had. We'd been there for several years. 
So you knew it well? We knew it well, yeah. We had some mules to hopefully, usually pack an animal out uh, that we harvested. Describe the day and how it started on this specific incident. We would start early, I mean like four in the morning, drive to a spot and then hike for maybe an hour or two in the dark. Work our way around, spot a elk, try and follow elk, um, look at some high lakes that we'd never seen before and never got up in there. We try and get back to the vehicles just before dark. On this date, you guys come back, you fix some dinner. Explain what happened then. I had finished my supper and went out to take a whiz and uh, was starting back to the trailer and, and Chris came out. I was, I don't know, maybe 15 feet from the trailer. And when I stepped down, obviously, your head goes up, the light went across, hit on something that's right there, and instant, instantly, that it was something that I didn't comprehend whatsoever. And when I saw that, that's when I, you know, went down on my knees. I just kind of turned to my right, went down on my knees. Chris looks up and just goes, holy shit, holy shit, holy shit. You guys have got to see this. I, I look up and I, I see what he's looking at. And I mean, I was quivering. I yelled. I was yelling basically at the top of my voice. Mark came out of the trailer. He said that, um, you know, he, he heard my voice and he'd never heard me sound that way before. He runs out and I just point up, uh, up above. It was huge. It, it was like a football field, 100 feet, direction, direction, triangular shape. So how far was the bottom of that craft from you in your estimate? I would say 80 feet, plus or minus, somewhere in there, above us. Rivets, panels? No, no, no that, was, that was one of the things that, I'm in construction, I like detail. Um, I was looking at that and that, the detail, just, uh, I couldn't believe, you know, there's, there's no seams, no rivets, no joints. It's all just one perfect surface. And it, and it you could just tell it was perfect. Uh, in every way. The thing that got me the most was how close it was and no noise, nothing. No prop wash, no breeze, no exhaust, um, nothing you could smell. Zero. And it was a calm night, no wind. By that time, it's starting to move up, and Mark and Rob both grabbed their binoc binoculars, and we just watched it just float up the draw, just slowly, no noise. Um, animals didn't make noise. Those mules never made a sound, and they never made any motion. I mean, they like nothing was going on. We weren't making any noise. <laughs> kind of in awe of what's going on and not knowing what it is. I'm thinking, man, that's sure no airplane. We actually took um, pieces of paper and drew up our own pictures and wrote down information. So Chris, I came across <clears throat> this. Did you draw that? I did draw this. Is that what it looked like? That's as similar as what I could come up with. What were the black dots outside the Don't red? know. I just remember seeing them. Um, didn't seem like there was anything. Um, and was the red dot uh, painted, or did it glow like the white did? It, it glowed like the white disc. Did the white lights also protrude from the bottom? Uh, it looked like maybe they were semi-domed, but it was not really pronounced. Um, like the drawing, you know, you draw that, it was more of a of white fog um, circle, not really any sharp edges or fine detail. Could it have been watching Rob? Could he have been a target for abduction and Chris coming out of the trailer thwarted that abduction? Triangular craft like this have been seen around the world. 
including most recently by our own U.S. military pilots. That night, did you stay in camp? Tried to, but just couldn't bring myself to do it. Did you get to know anybody else who lived in that general area and ask them if they'd seen something like this? There, there was people that we knew that were in there. and So Mark kind of hedged on, well, have you guys ever seen anything kind of different, you know, at some point or anything like that out in the valley? And so a little conversation about it. And, I just, well, we were standing, you know, on the dirt road, and I put my toe of my boot down and said, well, did you see something like this? And started to draw a triangle with my boot in the dirt, and I drew a straight line, and the guy standing next to me took his foot and pushed my foot away, and uh, he finished my drawing for me on that. And that was, there was nothing said or anything, but that, he finished my drawing. Was that some sort of validation for you? Um, well, it made me feel like, you know, okay, other people have noticed this. And uh, so, yeah, I guess it's a validation. So it did affect you. Oh, it did. <laughs> I guess. I'm, I'm vacillating, maybe. Since that night in 2000, anywhere that you've been out, have you seen other unidentified things in the sky? No. How about Mark or Rob? No, same thing. You know, never really seen anything that even would have guessed at it. So, Rob, there's going to be people that watch this, and they're going to say, I don't believe it. You know, it didn't happen. Uh, these guys were... And I'd be one of them. You'd be one of them. <laughs> yeah. So if you saw this story, you wouldn't believe the guys? Well... I'm skeptical, but I saw it. And how many times have you gone back to that same site since? The exact site? Yeah. Never. When we talk about the triangle UFO sighting by the hunters, I didn't realize at the time, but its location on a map coincides with the first documentary I did called Missing 411. And it involved the disappearance of Dior Kuntz. And when I look at a map directly east of the sighting of the Triangle by the Hunters, it's the exact location that Dior disappeared. Now, when you think about the vastness of the wilderness, what are the chances that these two incidents happened in such a close proximity to one another. But also looking at the map and my case files, it also coincides with the disappearance of Ray Jones. Now, Ray was a 39-year-old service station owner in Salmon who disappeared 53 years ago on a hunting expedition with friends. They separated, Ray disappeared, and for 53 years, he wasn't found. Now, a group of hunters that saw the, the triangular UFO, their dad actually knew Ray. And so every time they went out and hunted this area, they said that they were looking for Ray as well. He wasn't found. And then he's found this year at the bottom of a boulder field in an area that had been previously searched dozens of times, suddenly he's found there. And when you map these three incidents, you have a very neat triangle, which weirdly coincides with the shape of the triangle that was drawn by the hunters. Are there any new major developments in the case? Not really. Has Dior been found? No. Are there any named suspects? Not, not at this time. 
When an investigation starts to push the limits of standard everyday police protocol, I start to look for professionals on the outside that could assist me. I'm someone who's not so stubborn as to admit what I don't know. And at this point, I looked for professional help in the name of retired FBI agent John D'Souza. My name is John D'Souza. I was an FBI special agent for 25 years. I've worked all types of cases, counterterrorism, uh, violent crimes, paranormal cases as well. And uh, I'm pretty well known for that sort of thing. Now, your background to me is interesting because you've worked a variety of criminal cases. I worked the Unabomber case. I worked um, 1994 World Trade Center bombing. The biggest case you ever worked? It would have to be 9-11. John, how many times have you testified in front of, a, in front of a U.S. court for a U.S. attorney? Maybe like 100 times. And how many times has the court decided that you're an expert in a certain area? Probably every time I've testified. I, I can't think of anybody who's in a position more to tell the truth and with great things to risk than you. No. I've had agents in the past say, well, Dave, if there's a series of events that all kind of align up similar to what you've written about, meaning me, then those agents could be forwarding those reports to a profiling unit, and they're putting the pieces together to see if there's connections. Exactly. Yeah, that's true, too. So who would be directing those agents? Uh, it could be Washington, it could be the profiler unit, uh, behavioral sciences unit. Are there subject matter experts on UFOs, aliens, abductions? Well, that's what I was while I was doing the, uh, in the FBI. And what was your conclusion in general about these people that claim abductions and disappear and come back? We report on the ones that we talk about, uh, those are real, and I do believe that uh, they are connected to extra-dimensional beings, beings that come from outside of our reality. In many, many of my stories, uh, families in the woods, children are right next to them, everything's fine. They turn around one second and the kid's gone. They're not anywhere to be found. And the statement from the parents is, they were right there. And then the next second they're gone. Now, if that is true, that really does answer a conundrum about how they can disappear and nobody can realize it. Right. The time period is so short that their disappearance is not possible in our purely physical world. So when you investigated something like this, were you ever questioned later on by other departments or other agencies? No, not by other agencies, no. Departments? No, they, they don't want to know this sort of thing as much as, as much as they can avoid the uh, knowledge of this, no. Long time ago, this is back when I was a policeman, and uh, there were some FBI guys that were working a case on something else, and we were talking about, I don't, I don't even think it was anything spooky or paranormal, but it was something unrelated, and, and the agent said, Dave, our government will never acknowledge what they can't control. And I always remembered that statement. You believe that? Yeah, that's absolutely true. They can't acknowledge it if they can't control it, or even if they think they can't control it. Wow, what could I say? John D'Souza fits your typical model of an FBI agent, and I've dealt with several during my years in law enforcement. Ultra credible, tons of experience, uh, a stand-up guy who's speaking the truth. And during my time sitting in his office, you probably couldn't tell, but I, I was in stunned silence just listening to how he laid out the groundwork for so many issues related to our work. And he brought instant credibility to an arena where a lot of people don't even want to address. Uh, John's statement about parallel dimensions, his overview of missing people, and his statement about our work, all fell right in line with the 
1,500 people I've documented in the last 12 years. But that brings up uh, one of the cases that has continually sat in the back of my mind, and that's the incident and the disappearance of Reinhard Kirschner in Arizona. So this is the spot in April 2007. Reinhard Kirchner made his way from Germany. He was a physicist. He drove his uh, rented camper truck here, parked it, and started a hike. He'd been here before, and he liked it. Reinhard didn't make his meeting with his girlfriend at Las Vegas McCarran Airport. She called search and rescue. They eventually found his truck parked here on uh, Navajo property. Started a search. Several days, they found nothing. They know that he took his camera, they took a small backpack, and he walked into oblivion. Interesting part of the case was, while the sheriff was at his truck, there were some local ranchers that walked up and talked to him. And these people said that uh, during the time Reinhardt was gone, they had seen unusual lights in the sky here. And what is important about that to me as a law enforcement person is that they put that in the report as credible. His girlfriend eventually flew home to Germany. It's been over a decade, Reinhardt, and his property has never been found. What compelled Reinhardt to this location? The case remains open and we may never find answers. There is one particular case where credibility and evidence merge in one of the most bizarre cases I've ever investigated. One where the hunter reappeared with a story that tested the limits of believability, yet captured my imagination and strangely physical evidence. My name is Carl Higdon, and this is to talk about an incident that happened in 1974. So I told my wife I was gonna go south and go hunting. What percentage of the time that he went out hunting did you go with him? Always. Except this time? Um, yes. Carl and I are together mostly 24-7. So on October 25th, 74? He went, he went out by himself completely. And was that a rare occasion? Yes, very rare. So that area where this happened, had you ever been there before? No. Describe the best you can where this happened at. Which, which forest were you in? Medicine Bow National Forest. The area that this happened in was back to the north, right at the edge of the forest. So I got inside the National Forest. I walked down, oh, maybe three quarter mile. I seen five elk, but they didn't move. That was another strange thing. That what? Say that again? They didn't move. They just sat there. Carl entered the woods, lined up on a series of elk, and he even said that the elk weren't moving. Leveled his rifle at the animals, pulled the trigger. He says his gun went off. The bullet came out the end of the barrel and hit some type of invisible force field and dropped to the ground. That bullet was recovered by Carl and later analyzed, and it did hit something. What we don't know, but the unusual nature of the travel of that ammunition is so odd that I've never heard of it in any type of research before. You're, you're, you're standing there, you shot the rifle, you're turning and you see the craft. Give me as much detail as you can on that craft, Carl. Well, it was like looking at a piece of glass. Only it had borders around it. And I couldn't figure out what it was to start with. So when you're looking at the, at the cube, can you see through it and see forest behind it? Yes. Was yeah. there anything in the cube? Not that I could see. So it was just like, a, a glass square on four sides, seven foot by five foot, with nothing inside it, and you could kind of see through it. Right. What did you think when you first saw it? <laughs> I didn't know. I just kind of stared at it. 
because it was unusual. And this guy showed up and asked me if I was hungry. Told him, yeah. So this package of four pills drifted over to me, just like it was thrown at me. I took one. Next thing I know, I was in this cubicle, but it looked a lot bigger. There's five elk behind me. I said, you got my elk. He just looked at me and shrugged, told me what his name was Ozo. And they were down to get food. I said, you guys always come down. He said, yeah. We come down every so often. We get elk, deer from here and go to the ocean and get fish and take it back. This is a drawing that Carl drew in the hospital and the, the being had a, like a hand that was a cone and no hand here and his hair was like straw. And so this is a very descriptive drawing. What are these little things? Uh, this is kind of an apron, and it shows where the uh, kind of where the land is in his planet. Did he? Did Ozo seem to have a personality? He seemed to, like when he had talked to me. His lips never moved. I mean, it was back and forth. He seemed like he knew a lot. What color was his suit? Black. Black. The entire suit was black. Completely black because our sun burns them. So they have to wear black and they wear like, uh, like a scuba diver's uh, suit. Covers them completely. Did Colonel ever say if he only had one hand and didn't draw the second? Or mm -hmm. did... Yes, he did not have another hand here but he had a, like a cone over here. Carl ever have an opinion if this was a male or female? Uh, he, he figures it was a male. A male. And then this is a picture of the, um, the craft. And this was the controls. This is where Ozzo sat. And this is where Carl sat. And there was still five elk in here also. Then we lifted off and then I could see Looked like a ball down below. I figured it was the Earth. I didn't know. And he was taken to some place that could best be described as another planet. They took him behind the screen and eventually said, we don't need you. You don't fit what we need. The implication of Carl being is that he had a vasectomy and they needed somebody that was 100% fertile. I said, why? I got to go home. He said, don't worry, somebody come get you. They dropped me off and I hit the side of this hill and I rolled down it. This is a critical point. When Carl explained that he was dropped, I have investigated hundreds of cases with unusual circumstances that show that someone was dropped into that location. This isn't something that's normally talked about in investigations. A lot of times it's just pushed off as happenstance and an accident that the person fell into the place. There's much more to this, and Carl has explained it. It was after I got off work. I felt the need to go to him. I felt that he needed me, that I had to go help him. So you get out there, you have the sheriff there, and everyone's looking. You're sitting on the hill, and you eventually get told that they found Carl? Mm-hmm. The deputy sheriff got out of the pickup, crouched down with his gun, ready to shoot Carl if he had to, because we did not know what what was going on. So, so from visually looking at Carl then, did it even seem like it was your husband? Uh, he kept looking out through the windshield and saying, my elk, my elk, they took my elk, they took my elk. Who did you think they were? I had no idea what he was even talking about. 
So at the hospital, they do a full examination. Mm -hmm. They checked him over with a fine tooth comb. First, they wanted to know if he was on any drugs. He was not. And when I asked him, the Dr. Tonko, uh, about the spots on his lungs, he said, what spots? There's no spots. And in the x-ray, they found that his lungs were completely clear, which was highly suspicious and unusual because Carl had tuberculosis scars on his lungs. So something happened while he was gone that cleared that up. At the time, did you think that maybe something happened on that ship that they made you pure and clean? No, I think it was when I was behind the shield up there, because that's when he said, you're not what we want, we'll take you back. And I figured it was because of my vasectomy, but I'm not sure of that. If it was because of the vasectomy, was the insinuation that if you didn't have one, you weren't coming back? <laughs> That's what I gathered. So Carl insinuates that the entities didn't want him because his reproductive system wasn't intact. Now, if it was, we probably wouldn't even be talking about this story. So I read a name, and you, you can explain this to me, Dr. Leon Sprinkle. How did he come into the picture, and what did he do? Uh, he was a psychologist, and he was with the University of Wyoming. And he studies UFO uh, people, contactees. He could not say that he actually believed him, but he couldn't say that he did not. Carl took a lie detector test. In fact, he took, I don't know, three or four of them. What were the results of those? He's telling the truth as he believes. I don't know what other people think. But if they don't believe it, they don't have to. I mean, everybody to their own opinion. I know what happened to me. I'm Richard Beckwith. I am the city attorney for the city of Rock Springs. I'm also the state director for the Mutual UFO Network, and I have been a practicing attorney for the last 26 years. Kind of give us a general overview of what MUFON does. We are a worldwide or global organization dedicated to the study of UFOs for the benefit of humanity. And I'd like to think that that is exactly what we do. An incident that I interviewed the, the victim about was a man named Carl Higdon. I do remember that taking place. I think I was 14 years old when it happened. I'd like to know your thoughts about it. Well, first of all, I don't, I don't think that Carl was lying. I know Dr. Sprinkle very well, Dr. Leo Sprinkle. He investigated that case and did some hypnosis, some regressive hypnosis with Mr. Higdon, and his impression of the case was that Mr. Higdon was telling the truth, or at least what he believed to be the truth. So some of the things about that case, to me, reeked of credibility. He had lung congestion and scarring on his lungs before the incident and subsequent to it his lungs were clear yeah and then the the issue about the bullet coming out of the gun and stopping it hitting something and being recovered and even analyzed right they did examine the bullet and find that it had struck something uh, and something really hard it has these physiological characteristics that are just unexplained so in your experience and in, in your readings of people who have been abducted, how does the Higdon case compare as far as the physical evidence? Most abduction cases don't really involve a lot of physical evidence. We have the Higdon incident, a hunter, German surname, hunting elk by himself, claims he's been abducted. In that same general area, just last year, there was a guy named Mark Stripmater. You know about that case? A couple of different things that I find interesting about that case is that here you've got an individual that's the same age, approximately, as Mr. Higdon, also about the same time of year. Mr. Higdon's incident took place on October 25th, 1974, and Mr. Stripmater went missing on October 19th of 2019, almost 
35 years exactly to the day in a relatively similar location. So we're on Forestry Road 801, and we are in the area where Mark Stripmater was coming to go elk hunting on October 19, 2019 in the Medicine Bow National Forest. And about 200 yards before Forestry Road 830, he pulls to the side of the road for some reason. And there's some theories behind, maybe he was pulling over because he saw one of his hunting targets, big bull, cross the road, deer, who knows. But he pulls to the side of the road, stops, gets out of his vehicle, and he takes a light coat, a light day pack, leaves his big pack in the car, leaves his keys in the vehicle, and he gets out. Off camera, the search and rescue person told me that Mark was a 15-year veteran outfitter for big game in this area. So he knew the outdoors super well. He knew how to track. And he knew elk didn't walk in a straight line. Elk take off and they wander. So to think that Mark is more than a mile, two miles from here chasing an elk doesn't make a lot of sense. My name is Kim Meese. I was girlfriend of Mark Stripmatter when he went missing. In your view, what, way, what made Mark special? He was just a giving person. So how comfortable was he in the woods? Oh, he grew up in the woods. He started hunting when, as soon as he could, 12, 13 years old. He, so, he knew what he was doing. Yeah, oh, yeah. And the area that he went missing from, where I found his truck at, we never hunted that area. But that morning that he had went out on the 19th that he went missing, I had already made plans to come to Rollins to watch my grandkids. And he knew that there was a snowstorm coming in and I was worried about him. And uh, he tried calling and sent me a text and said that he'd missed an elk and that he was done. So I assumed he was coming back to Saratoga, which is like 40 minute drive from where we hunt from. So I hung out around the house for a little bit and he never showed up and I left and I was trying to get a hold of him that night to make sure he made it back before the snow hit and trying to call and text and texts weren't delivered, phone calls were going directly to voicemail. I hauled Aspa up there looking for the truck and then when I got to that intersection I looked to my left and that's where I saw the pickup was sitting. Explain how it was sitting. It was on the east side of the road facing north. Did it look like he parked it there? Yeah. Did it look out of place to you at all? Yeah. yeah. It did? It did. And when I got to it, um, like I said, it had snowed, and I had to clean off probably 12, 15 inches of snow just to get into it. And when we would hunt, we always left our key and our gas thing so I was able to get in the truck, and that's when I found his phone and cigarettes, his medication. The only thing that was missing was him and his pack and gun. So when he texted you last, what did it say? The last text, it says, I got it, 11 o'clock. It says, I'm done, I suck, missed a nice five-pointer small, six and a small five-pointer in, and a perfect broadside shot even closer, but I thought I had one down but walked down to find shit. So from that, it kind of sounded like he was done. Yeah, and that's what I assumed, that maybe he was coming back to town. You find the truck, you can't find him. Do you look around at all, or do you just call the sheriff? No, I walked around the area just to see if I could see any track or anything, and I didn't see anything. So I came back to Saratoga and called the sheriff's deputy. So right off the bat, we came in, the first day we came in with a whole bunch of ground pounders and we just went shoulder to shoulder and walked timber. And then we went around and picked a different spot near the truck and chose a different direction and started pounding more timber. That initial search, how many days did it last? The first time around I think was seven days if I'm not mistaken. So like I said, we were gone for the first two days of it. And then when we got back, we took off and looked for him. And I think total, I had five days in it. 
And was there a subsequent effort to find him? We did go back this spring. Um, we spent a full day with quite a few resources out and three different dog teams. Did your canines hit on any scent anywhere? I never had a hit. How odd is it not to pick up any scent? Very. <laughs> as much ground as we covered and as many different wind patterns as we hit, you would think, you know, law of averages, you'd at least get a head turn out of it. Just somebody should have at least tripped over him, the amount of people we've had out. And we flew drones in the canyon. Well, three of the canyons, we flew drones in them. Did you have any other kind of air support? We did, we had civil air, the last fall we had civil air in, and they flew for us for a couple days. Was there any evidence anywhere of animal predation? You know what, I saw, we tracked one bear to see what he was, where he was gonna go. But the only other thing I noticed is we never had birds during that search. And birds are an indicator of? A body. You, you can kind of hone in onto it yeah. by the birds. Yeah, and I mean, I, I run dogs, I'm a firm believer in dogs, but at the same time, if the birds already have eyes on him, that makes it a lot easier. And how odd was this search? Very, to not, most people have kind of a pattern. I mean, if you're out hunting and you see an elk, you know, run across the road, you're probably gonna go find a spot to actually park, not just pull to the edge of the road and jump out. How difficult would it be for somebody to be lost in there? <laughs> if you really want it out, everything around here, you just walk downhill until you find a road. And you'll eventually hit a road? Eventually, you might have to cross private property, yeah. but if you're worried about dying in the middle of it, who cares? So in talking to the search and rescue people, I asked them, I said, so was there anything odd about this? The whole thing was odd. Yeah. So they said that the canines didn't pick up a scent. No. They didn't see any tracks. They never recovered any of his property. Mm -mm. The weather changed the next day, and if Mark knew the weather was changing, he wouldn't have stayed out there. No. At what point did you tell yourself, hey, Mark may not be coming back? After they got done searching, they just said, you know, it doesn't look good. A lot of people said a lot of strange things about this case. And in your time with Mark out there, did you guys ever experience anything weird? As far as? Anything weird. He was out hunting deer during rifle, and he swore he saw a UFO out there. He was coming out from hunting, and he just happened to look up and um, saw, it, like he said, it was just like hovering, following him and it freaked him out. And he tried to look at it through his binoculars, but it was getting dark. And it, so he, it scared him. What did it look like to him? He said it was just like a black hover. It was just black, it was just hovering. And it scared him? Yeah, because it was like it was following him out. Another odd question. Did Mark have a vasectomy? A vasectomy? Yeah, no. he didn't. And it, did he say how long he saw this thing? He said it was just following him. It, and then it just like disappeared. What did you think when you heard that? It kind of freaked me out, because he was freaked out. And he was a pretty calm guy. Mm hmm And would he be the kind of person to ever make up stories like that? No. So when you heard that from him, believability 100%? Mm hmm hmm. That's crossed my mind too, after he told me that story. Maybe there was something out there. So how many years were you guys together? 13? 13. And when he disappeared, how would you describe your relationship that previous week? Um, normal. Normal? Yeah. And how did Mark get along with your kids? Fine. How did Marley take this? Well, she's having a rough time. And when you sit and you talk to Marley about it, what do you guys talk about? She's just sad that he's not here anymore. Yeah, she took it hard. And then finally, she just kept asking me after he left if he was coming back. 
it's hard for me to talk to her about it. So the million dollar question, what happened to Mark Strip made her? But that same question can be applied to the thousands of other cases I've investigated that follow the same profile points we've discussed here. Families don't have answers. We move on to the next case, and it's something that follows me every day. And I have great empathy for the families that are left behind. I've always been of the opinion that there aren't such a thing as coincidences. Just east of where Carl disappeared, there was another man named Gustafson, and uh, he was from Minnesota, another elk hunter, and uh, he also disappeared and was never found. Now, he was older, he was in his 70s, also in Medicine Bow, but those, those three cases were in geographical proximity to one another. Well, we're in the Medicine Bow National Forest, about 20 miles due east of where the Higdon and Stripmater case happened. Same forest, different location. We're at about 8,000, 9,000 feet high up. And this is the location that Charles Gustafson, a 72-year-old man from Minnesota, came out with his family. And on October 11th, 2006, split up from his family and they decided to hunt different areas. Gustafson went off for the day. He didn't come back that night. His family members got concerned. He was carrying a trailside GPS. He had a compass. He had food, he had water. The interesting part about this gentleman is he had survival training in the military. And so he knew how to, how to live out here in the wilderness. To think that he got out here and he got lost Kind of difficult to understand. My name is Jerry Colson. I'm the retired sheriff of Carbon County, Wyoming. And in 2006, when Charles Gustafson was here elk hunting, in October of that year, he went missing, and I was a sheriff at that time. So in the articles, it said that uh, he was camped with, I think, a nephew and some other relatives near Forest Road 111 and 129. Does that kind of ring right? Correct. I'd also heard that he had been to this area many times in the past. Yeah, according to family members, they, they, they hunt this area pretty regular. And what kind of resources would you pull for something like this? Four-wheel drive and searchers on foot. Quested a helicopter out of Warren Air Force Base in Cheyenne, military helicopter. Uh, we would use Civil Air Patrol, for, so we'd go, th you know, air search. And we eventually we had uh, searchers on horseback, too. Brought in some uh, canines. Uh, uh, both cadaver and search dogs. As the time went on, we went with cadaver. Did any dog pick up a scent trail? No, nothing that uh, led to Mr. Gustus. He searched for, what, a week? It's about six days. I had to call it off on about the sixth day because of the weather coming in. The helicopters were there till it started snowing and they had to go. The unusual nature of being lost in the woods and not found, is that unusual? It's not unusual for people to come lost in the woods. It is unusual and not commonplace for, for us not to find them within a day or two. People who watch this will say, oh, you know, maybe this was a case of animal predation. What would you say to that? I mean, we have bears. I can tell you the whole time I was sheriff, and anywhere, I worked at sheriff's office since, for 39 years. I never remember anybody being attacked by a bear. How long was it before anybody found anything related to him? There were some fishermen down there in, in Rock Creek Canyon. And they were just walking along, whatever, and all of a sudden you look over there and here's this rifle sitting in the fork of a tree, you know, leaning, leaning in the fork of a tree right by the creek. So they picked it up and brought it out and turned it over and we got it and confirmed to the family it was his rifle. Was anything else found in that immediate area? Myself and some other searchers, we went down to that, right that area where everything was found. And I actually sat down on the side of the hill there by the creek and I looked over and about 10 foot from me, here's this fanny pack. It had a water bottle, and I remember that, so it turned out to be Charlie's fanny pack. So was any of his clothing or shoes or any of that found? There was nothing. Other than his fanny pack and rifle, that's all that's been found. So we have Charles's disappearance in Northern Medicine Bow. You have the strip mater disappearance. 
just southwest of where Charles disappeared. You also have the Higdon disappearance. On the northwest sector of Cheyenne is Warren Air Force Base. And this is the location that did the air support on the disappearances we marked here. Surprisingly, I found some documents about UFOs being observed by on-duty Air Force personnel at Warren. All three men of German heritage, all three men elk hunters, I had to ask myself, are there other hunters missing from this region that match that profile? Are there any hunters that have gone missing in recent times that kind of match the profile of these other guys? Yeah, a guy named Terry Metter, uh, who was a teacher here in Rock Springs. I actually knew him, and uh, he was a teacher when I was in high school. Uh, and he came up missing when he'd gone out to go hunting. And the area that he was in, can you kind of explain it to us? Well, it's very typical of southwest Wyoming. It's uh, sagebrush, prairie. Uh, it's what we call high desert, isolated. Not a lot of cover no. there. So where could he go? He'd have to crawl into a hole. And there are not a lot of holes there? No, not a lot of caves. I mean, it's open desert. Anything out there in the middle of the desert that could hurt him? On occasion, we've had a wolf or two. I can't think of any large predatory animals that would be able to, you know, take a human being and drag him off somewhere. What would you be your thinking on that? I suppose we could say that there's a possibility he was abducted, uh, but there's no evidence of that. All we know is that he was there, and then he's not there anymore. This is in the middle of nowhere desert, and his truck was stuck in a ditch, and they searched for a week and they never found him. Do you see any, any convening of the facts, any assimilation that you could make between all of these guys? One of the big similarities, of course, is that they're all by themselves, and they're all elk hunting. With the exception of Mr. Metter, they're all about the same age. In your time as uh, monitoring MUFON activity in Wyoming, have you ever heard of anything similar to this? It were the cases involving Pat McGuire, who owned a ranch over in the eastern part of Wyoming. And he had a series of incidents, I guess you could say, involving UFOs. And I was fortunate enough to be able to sit in on one of the regressive hypnosis sessions. And he had some experiences. And he was allegedly told by a race of alien beings that uh, he was to build a well, to dig a well on this location in uh, or near Wheatland, Wyoming. He took that very seriously. He actually went out and bought himself a tank uh, and he got the motor off it to pump the water out of this well. But he had geologists and all these other folks tell him that he was crazy for wanting to put the well where he wanted to put it because it was just a solid slab of rock. And there was no way he was ever gonna get any water, but he insisted that the aliens had told him that there was water there and by God, he was gonna dig that well. And he did. Boy, and you just said something that is huge to me. So in the United States, we have 64 geographical clusters of missing people that fit our profile points. As unusual as it sounds, right down the middle of the United States, there's an area where there are no disappearances. Several months ago, I got an email from somebody who worked from the, for the government. And he said, Dave, that area of the US corresponds to a area which has been described by the US Geological Survey as an underground water area called the Ogallala Aquifer. And he says, you should see if it corresponds with your profile map. Well, what we did is we overlaid that on top of our cluster map. It's almost a near match, which is interesting. Because of my background with MUFON and UFOs, I also know about underwater submerged objects. And those are essentially just UFOs that have gone to water. And if there was a way to keep yourself hidden, yet 
make yourself apparent at certain times, it would be by using the aquifer and going out through Wyoming. And when you think about the McGuire incident and the ability of the UFOs to go through the aquifer and up out of as well, if they wanted, and then their proximity in Southwest Wyoming to all the incidents we've talked about. Again, it's another one of those coincidences that you can't ignore. The Ogallala Aquifer. That covers almost the exact area where nobody is missing. And I put it in the back of my mind and I didn't think much about it, but damn, you saying that this person digs a well and it's an offshoot from the Ogallala and the aliens told him to do it. Yeah. That's weird. Now what's really weird is they tell him to do it and all the geologists and all those guys tell him that there's nothing there, he's crazy for doing and he digs the well anyway and taps in and finds the water. So the crazy guy was right. Now, did the aliens tell him to dig the well? I don't know, Pat said, certainly believed that the aliens told him to dig the well. The reason for the digging of the well was so that uh, in the event that there was a, a global cataclysm, that there would be a fresh source of water for the inhabitants of that location when it took place. Let's put all of this into perspective. If we plot the locations of the Wyoming cluster of missing hunters on a map, this coincides with the spread of chronic wasting disease throughout southeast Wyoming. Chronic wasting disease is decimating the elk and deer populations in this region. All of the missing and abducted men were elk hunters, and all of them disappeared in close proximity to Warren Air Force Base, where numerous UFO sightings have been credibly documented by government officials. We know from the Higdon and the elk abduction cases that these beings, wherever they are, are interested in North American elk. We can hypothesize that perhaps these beings are monitoring our elk population for what is possibly the worst wildlife disaster in North America. Just northeast of this cluster is Pat McGuire's ranch, where the beings told him to dig a well for water that miraculously was fed by the Ogallala Aquifer there are no clusters of missing around this property, nor are there clusters of missing in the main body of the aquifer. All the victims in this incident were elk hunting. Each was alone. Two of the hunters in Wyoming observed a UFO. Canines could never pick up a scent. A UFO in Washington was observed taking an elk. Carl Higdon observed elk on a UFO. Only one victim was ever found, and that was Colonel Higdon, who believed he was returned because he had a vasectomy. Let's not forget the first missing person case, Ray Salmon from Harrison Lake, British Columbia. Ray and his wife had seen UFOs in the British Columbia forest in the past. Ray was a hunter. He was German. He was camped adjacent to a lake. Canines never picked up a scent. His clothes and rifle were found on a beach. He disappeared and was never found. It's another incident that is an exact match to the Wyoming cases. As incredible as it sounds, you have to start wondering what is happening here. There's nowhere to turn, and I, I don't think we left many stones unturned. Frustration and fear turns to anger, anger to loss of hope. As an investigator, you do your due diligence. If you can't provide closure in a traditional sense, and the incredible or paranormal may be tied to the disappearance. How do you explain that to a grieving family that we might be dealing with something that is just beyond the normal and the extreme that leads to unknown consequences? It puts me in a difficult situation. It puts you in a difficult situation. When you have families that are missing a loved one, yeah. I can't go tell them this. Exactly. Exactly. Who's going to believe me? Yeah. Um, yeah, you can't because it's it's unprovable. It's in a, in a purely physical world. It's just not provable. Yet eyewitnesses' reports of unexplained events in the skies are increasing exponentially. How many calls do you think you get a year? Uh, I would say between 30 and 100 per day, typically. So... Say in rough round figures, somewhere between 20 and 30,000 calls a year. 
and the conviction and credibility of those who have witnessed them is unnerving to say the least. Believe it or not, I just know what I saw. A lot of truths are really experiential. Elk hunters of German heritage are being taken in specific regions in North America. Witnesses corroborate bizarre occurrences in the sky directly related to these incidents. What's left are the words of those who have lost so much and those who return to share their stories.